Good day, everybody. This is Chris back again, and uh, now we're going to continue our discussion on uh, COVID-19 slash SARS-CoV-2. And again, this is uh, pertinent and up to date as of 17 March 2020. And in this particular video, I'm going to talk about uh, treatment and uh, specifically, I'm going to focus on inpatient treatment. Uh, so just to review, again, most patients will not have serious manifestations. That is to say the COVID-19 uh, that they develop will be very mild. They'll have uh, flu-like signs and symptoms, maybe some minor dyspnea, fever, and a lot of patients will um, spontaneously resolve and they won't have significant morbidity or mortality. That's about 80%. Uh, approximately 15 to 20 percent again it, it, that is the exact number is still experiencing a lot of flux but approximately 15 to 20 percent of patients with COVID-19 are going to require inpatient treatment all right so how are we going to manage these patients and the, again this is going to be a high yield overview so I'm not going to go into highly detailed conversations uh, but this will be more of a, of a big picture look uh, so 15 20 percent of these patients um, so if any patient presents with concerning signs and symptoms so they have a substantial history and physical exam and other labs suggesting that you may be dealing with an acute viral illness and it may in fact be COVID-19 then we need to look at isolating that patient we want to isolate them we want to prevent uh, contact with them as much as possible and you should uh, defer to your uh, facility or your institution's uh, protocols and procedures for personal protective equipment uh, but you want to isolate and minimize the amount of time that you come into direct contact with that patient and you want to prevent other people from coming into direct contact with that patient so you want to have pref preferably you want to have an area where that patient can go you want to try to do most of your conversations uh, via perhaps a phone type device or a telephonic type communication device if possible, um, negative pressure rooms, uh, and appropriate personal protective equipment, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, next, we want to be able to do definitive testing, right? And the definitive testing currently is a polymerase chain reaction uh, probe or PCR probe. And for many areas that will be a send out. That is to say that here in the United States at least we don't have the capacity or the capability of organically running these tests at individual facilities. Some facilities are beginning to implement uh, guidelines and ca capabilities that allow them to do the specific PCR testing uh, re required to uh, identify COVID-19, or rather to identify the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus. However, most places currently don't, particularly smaller outlying facilities that are going to get hit hard potentially by this stuff. So that means that this needs to be sent out, which means that you need to notify the appropriate resources. Right? So your facility should be in close contact with your state department of health, and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, right? You need to have a whatever number that you need or whatever pathway that your state disaster guidelines dictate, whatever pathway you need to get on to contact that state and to facilitate the definitive testing. This testing is not going to be right away, at least currently here in the United States. It's going to take some time, and it may even take... A few days to get results back right so we're not definitively going to know that's why it's so important that we want to have a high index of clinical suspicion for COVID-19 based on the signs symptoms history physical exam and some of the lab tests and diagnostic imaging that I mentioned in the prior video all right so concerning signs and symptoms they present to healthcare facility we need to isolate we need to test and we need to notify and then we need to try to figure out where this patient is in their course now of that 15 to 20 percent not all of them are going to be critically ill uh, many of them will have mild to moderate symptomology and that is to say that we can manage them 
with good supportive care, maybe some supplemental oxygen, maybe some bronchial hygiene, uh, maybe some bronchodilators if they have uh, a bronchospasm and those kinds of things, and we can manage them relatively conservatively. And then there will be a subset of patients who will have more severe manifestations. And in some cases, these patients can deteriorate very rapidly. So they will, again, kind of have this biphasic, uh, this biphasic presentation where they have these mild signs and symptoms, they seem to improve, and then they get worse and they can rapidly deteriorate over you know, a period of a couple of hours. So if we are concerned about respiratory failure, they are not oxygenating, they're not responding to supportive care, supplemental oxygen, uh, we need to think about more aggressive therapy early. Um, in general, it is currently, uh, I think it's probably going to be best to avoid non-invasive ventilation and other forms of non-invasive ventilation such as CPAP or uh, bi-level uh, positive pressure ventilation non-invasively or high-flow nasal cannula simply because these forms of support substantially increase the risk of droplet production and aerosolization, which is going to substantially increase the infection uh, control hazard with that patient. It's better if they are in going into respiratory failure, it may be better to simply intubate that patient um, and then you can have a control. You can get HEPA filters um, on the uh, inhalation exhalation ports uh, you can get additional exhalation filters and you can control some of the uh, secretions that are coming out of that patient uh, for infection control purposes. So what do we want to do? Well, we want to consider early intubation if these patients have severe signs and symptoms or their, their signs and symptoms or labs are changing rapidly. Again, these patients often will develop a kind of pneumonia, an interstitial pneumonia, uh, with uh, market or substantial peripheral involvement, and they will often have an ARDS-like appearance. Right? They will look a lot like they're in ARDS. They will have a refractory hypoxemia that will not respond very well to um, supplemental oxygen. So uh, intubate them early and then be prepared to have them on a ventilator for a substantial amount of time. They may require prolonged ventilatory support. Um, and of course, people that are more likely to have severe signs and symptoms are people that have other comorbidities coming into this. They may have underlying lung disease, they may have underlying immunosuppression, they may have uh, severe or poorly controlled diabetes, or severe poorly controlled um, hypertension, so you're going to have other com comorbidities that you're going to be dealing with. Um, but in general, we're going to manage these patients a lot like ARDS because essentially we're dealing with ARDS or acute respiratory distress syndrome, right? So we're going to look at uh, lower tidal volumes, increasing PEEP, PEEP ladder therapies, proning these patients. There is some evidence to suggest that pa placing these patients in a prone position can help with recruiting alveoli and may in fact help oxygenate these patients, giving them paralytics, of course good uh, sedative and analgesic uh, coverage on top of that. You may consider antibiotics if you suspect a bacterial co-infection and you want to be very cautious with fluids. It is very easy and there is some evidence that uh, fluid resuscitation may be harmful in these patients and may be problematic, particularly because uh, there may be a subset of these patients that could develop cardiovascular compromise, things like cardiomyopathies, um, as a result of the uh, COVID-19 um, syndrome. Uh, so if they don't if they don't necessarily need large volumes of fluids, you want to be really cautious with fluids. Um, so these patients don't have like your standard bacterial uh, sepsis and septic shock presentation. Fluids may be harmful, so be cautious with fluids. And you want to just reference ARDSNET guidelines, right? General lung protective strategies, right? Looking at low tidal volumes, perhaps pressure control ventilation, 
maybe consider other types of modes of ventilation, a APRV, bi-level, uh, those kinds of things. I have not seen a lot of any specific data on high-frequency oscillatory ventilation or high-frequency jet ventilation, so I, I don't know what to say there other than that may play a role in these patients who are refractory. And then, of course, uh, what about this newer technology that's becoming popular, ECMO, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation? I don't know. I, I don't know. We don't know who might be the best candidate for this. Uh, I'm going to be quite honest. There are only certain institutions that have robust ECMO programs, and it is very likely that when we get to that point where we have lots of patients where we're thinking about ECMO, we're probably not going to even have the capacity to institute ECMO for many of these patients simply because we don't have the resources uh, to do that. So uh, I wish I could say something about that. Uh, so it's really going to be, at this point, managing these patients like ARDS. It's going to be like managing an ARDS patient. Um, and hopefully getting them through, and it could be several days even, and then you're looking at weeks or possibly even months of uh, rehabilitation in these more severe uh, patients. And obviously mortality is going to be fairly high in patients that present with severe signs and symptoms. Now, on top of that, there are some investigational therapies that we're looking at. And there just isn't enough evidence out there for me to say one way or another. But there are some investigational therapies. I'd mention them. We're looking at some uh, agents that have antiviral activity. Uh, remdesivir is uh, one. Uh, remdesivir is, a, is an agent, uh, I believe, that we looked at it for um, uh, treating Ebola. Uh, it essentially works by blocking an enzyme called uh, RNA-dependent polymerase enzymes uh, that has shown some possible success. Again, we don't know. Uh, chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, which uh, are uh, uh, anti-malarial drugs, um, they uh, work through some zinc mechanism um, and essentially may help to prevent viral entry into the, uh, into the cell um, through a, kind of a zinc-mediated um, mechanism. Also, Tamivir is another, um, is another antiviral. It blocks another protein embedded in the, uh, the viral envelope uh, called neuraminidase um, and may uh, help prevent docking and attaching uh, of the virus. Uh, corticosteroids right, may help with the inflammation. Uh, again, there's just not a whole lot of evidence. Uh, all of these are investigational, but again, we're looking at them, we're trying them out. Uh, there's literature just being published. The amount of literature that's being published is, is unprecedented. Uh, and it is it's just evolving hour by hour, new stuff is coming out. But those are just some of the investigational therapies. So it's possible within some number of months, we may have some therapy uh, some antiviral therapy like remdesivir or hydroxychloroquine or uh, oseltamivir that, that may be reasonably effective. I don't know. Um, and regarding a vaccine, uh, we have just begun phase, phase one uh, trials of vaccine or early phase trials of, of vaccine. So we're currently giving uh, vaccine, a vaccine candidate maybe more now. Uh, but at least one vaccine candidate is being uh, given to very small numbers of healthy individuals in the Seattle area. Uh, but uh, realistically, we're probably, if things go really well, best case scenario, maybe a year and a half to two years away from a uh, truly effective and safe vaccine. Uh, and beyond that, I don't really have a whole lot else to say. Uh, some of these patients may develop multi-organ failure, so we may have to look at bringing in renal replacement therapy. So you're looking at um, dialysis to support these patients if they develop uh, renal failure or acute kidney injuries. Um, and then, you know, secondary viral and bacterial infections can occur. You're going to have possibly some related... Uh, 
you know, like ventilator-associated pneumonia, cardiomyopathies in some patients, uh, but you want to really be prepared for prolonged mechanical ventilation and a, a fairly long, torturous clinical course. And uh, unfortunately, we, it may come to this. I don't know. Again, it's going to really depend on how stressed the medical system in the United States is. And that's all of these videos are from the, the context of someone in the United States because that's, that's where I live and that's the system I know. So I can't really speak for other countries, but I have seen other countries like Iran, for example, and parts of Italy where right, um, they may not, their areas where they don't even have a ventilator, right? So you have these sick patients. I don't even have a ventilator to put them on. I don't even have a, a lung protective strategy to use in my back pocket. And uh, we may get to the point where we may have to start triaging our resources if it gets that bad. And I'm not saying it is. I'm not saying it isn't either. I, I don't know. I don't know what way that curve is going to go like I've talked about in prior earlier videos. Um, my senses were a little behind the curve so to speak, uh, pun intended, I suppose. I just don't know. Um, but it, it may get to that point where in so certain areas of the country, we just don't have enough resources and we have to triage and we have to go, well, I'm going to have to deny this resource to this person because of you know extremes of age, underlying issues, and, and perhaps shunt those resources to other patients that are less sick. I don't know. It, it may come to that, but... Uh, this is just kind of the standard high yield treatment and some of the investigational therapies that uh, we're looking at. Maybe something will happen in the next few months, uh, but we're still at least a few months away, best case scenario, for some of these investigational therapies to pan out or to not pan out. Uh, so we'll, we'll see what happens. Okay, I, I think I'll cut it off here and then I will um, be talking about... Uh, disposition and prognosis, and then just some general infection control or uh, precautionary uh, guidelines when it comes to uh, personal protective equipment and uh, so on in subsequent videos. All right, guys, you all take care.